And I would like to acknowledge our geriatric colleagues. Um, so if, if I could take one minute um, to ask you to just say hi, if that's okay. Hi, I'm Ken Chen. I'm a geriatric medicine doctor from Stanford Senior Care Clinic, uh, and I work mostly in the nursing home, assistant living, uh, and we are certainly familiar with oropharyngeal uh, dysphagia, yes. but uh, we wanted to learn more about, um, uh, you know, esophageal uh, dysphagia as well. I'm excited uh, to be here to learn more about uh, esophageal disorders in the elderly. Thank you. Juliana. Hi, I'm Juliana Marwell. I'm one of the other geriatricians. I work in Stanford Senior Care and I do inpatient geriatric consults. Anyone else? I think I apologize I see if I don't Nanette. And is that Nanette Store Street? If you want to introduce yourself, I'm not sure. I see Nanette S. They may be not available. Maybe she stepped away for a second. And then I don't oh. think I see any other geriatric team members right now. Great. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask George to say a few things um, about John and the presentation. Um, thank you, Ray. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is a series of uh, discussions about uh, gastrointestinal issues in the elderly. And we have had already two of these exchanges, which were particularly practical and down to earth and useful to everybody, including us as gastroenterologists. Today, we have uh, Dr. Clark, who is an associate professor at Stanford and heading the esophageal group uh, of the so-called SEMPI, which is a big unit that basically addresses clinical, educational, and research aspects in esophageal disease. And we're all looking forward to your presentation, John. Um, uh, vis-a-vis -vis specifically the elderly population, but you can expand as much as you wish. Um, looking forward to it. Thank you. Great, great, great. Well, thank you. Appreciate the, um, the invite to talk and thanks everybody for uh, being here. Um, I'm, I'm going to- Two of us for really being here. Yeah, yeah, three of <laughs> us, yeah. So um, I, I'm, I'm gonna try and make this as um, informal as we can in the context of Zoom, which I know is challenging, but feel feel free to interrupt with any questions along the way. Um, the, the way that I've, I've got this, um, this uh, talk arranged is that I'm going to do five very, very quick cases that just illustrate different points and then talk a little bit about some of the, the um, different clinical issues that come up. But definitely feel free to interrupt with any questions, comments, or observations. And I know uh, some of the people in, in, in this group, I know Can, Can and her team have obviously seen this from a um, different perspective than we, we do. And so I'd love, love to hear um, their um, um, insights and observations. And uh, some, some of the uh, senior GI people, such as George and Atul, have obviously been been seeing this as well in their patients for decades. So I'd love to also get get their sense as well. Um, just as um, um, you know, you know, just as kind of a preface to this talk, this is an area where I think that if any aspiring fellow really wanted to make a career, um, this is definitely a hot area, and there's not a lot of recent papers. When I look back at a lot of the sources which are here, um, a bunch of them are from uh, 1950s to 1990s, there's really not a lot of recent papers which are on this. So given how large an issue this is and will uh, uh, be in the future, it's definitely a hot area in terms of uh, possible exploration. So, you know, as uh, background, so by 2030, 21% of the U.S. will be greater than age 65, and patients who are beyond the age of 75 will have as many as six times um, those visits as uh, those who are younger, and this is approximately one-third of our healthcare expenses. So um, regardless of whether you're doing esophageal clinic or a general clinic, this is an issue that will um, you know, be seen in our patients. When we look at the esophagus and aging, can kind of break it down into three different categories. And so there are some symptoms that are common in people who are young and they're common in people who are old. And so GERD is a um, good example of that. About 20% of US adults 
will have symptoms of heartburn or, or something with reflux approximately once a week, 50 per person about once a year. And, and it's interesting, if you look at this at, at GERD specifically across the, the age stratum, um, there is a thought that as people get older, they may actually become slightly less sensitive in their esophagus so that um, people may complain less about heartburn than those who are younger. But the flip side is that you're more likely to have issues such as hernias. And so your rates may be slightly higher. Complaints may, may be lower. At the end of the day, it's unclear if it's significantly different. Um, but you are more inclined to see complications such as barracks and cancer and things along those lines. Um, but then there are some, some symptoms that are definitely more common as people get older. And so the big one in that category is dysphagia. And so if you um, look at this across the U.S., when, when they've um, done population studies, it's um, self-reported that about 4% of adults within the U.S. will uh, report that they have problems swallowing. Um, and the thought is that in people who are younger, that's, that's mostly GERD with um, um, second is EOE. Um, and then as people get older, that rate go, goes, goes up. And so in a paper in Sweden, about 16% of adults um, ab above the age of 87 reported dysphagia. And if you look at different studies that have been done in um, skilled nursing facilities and, and such, the rates there are between 30 to 70 per percent. And, and, and most of them are approximately 40. Um, and so that's definitely something that we'll, you know, we'll talk about more, but that's definitely more common as people get older. And then you have some, um, you, you do have some situations that are really, um, you know, seem pretty unique towards the older population. And so Zankers, for instance, you know, is one example. That's just something that you won't really see in anyone below the age of approximately, you know, approximately mid 40s. And so during the, the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to go through it, I think. Sorry, John, quick yeah, question. Yeah. So, so the statistics, even though they're, they're white, I'm just curious, does that include oropharyngeal problems yes. as well? Yeah, it does. Okay, so it it's does. oropharyngeal and the software, yes. both. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's both. It's both. So during, during the, the uh, next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to go through these five topics. And we'll talk, talk about oropharyngeal motility first. We'll talk about upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction. We'll uh, talk about esophageal spasm and dysmotility, hernias, and then special considerations. And for each one, I've got a, 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 a case with a multiple choice question just to think about. So case one, an 84-year-old year presents to see you in clinic because of uh, dysphagia. And her family has noticed she has a hard time swallowing pills and also occasionally solids and liquid. She feels things are getting stuck in the back of her throat and has to mix up most of her meds with applesauce. She has occasional coughing with food and eats much more slowly than prior. You get a modified barium swallow, which shows contrast retention and pooling within the, within the, uh, within the vallecula with a limited views, views of, with, with limited views from the esophagus. What do you tell her? Do you tell her that she probably had a stroke and that this is minor sequela, that she likely has Parkinson's and this is an early manifestation, that she may have something going on in her lower esophagus and she should have a full esophagram or else endoscopy, or this is probably a normal consequence of aging. And so I, I won't ask anyone to, to, to give votes, but just think about it a little bit. And then we'll, we'll talk about oropharyngeal motility. So it's interesting that um, dysfunction of the pharynx, the tongue, and the upper sphincter are well described with aging. And what's thought to take place is that, you know, keep in mind that these, these, these are all skeletal muscles. And so past the age of 65, we um, um, see a reduction in lean mass, which occurs with age. And so with the process of normal aging, there is a reduction in, um, 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 in a tongue strength and the ability to propel food. And it's interesting that the tongue strength reduction appears to mirror grip strength. So um, you, you can think of those as being somewhat synonymous. There's also a decrease within uh, muscle fi fibers as well in the pharyngeal constrictors. And so typically when we swallow, what takes place is you get food in the mouth, you chew it, you push it back with the tongue, you contract the, um, um, the um, inferior and superior pharyngeal constrictors that helps to open the cricopharyngeus. The cricopharyngeus um, has to essentially 
be activated to open. And so if it's weak and dysfunctional, it stays tonically closed. And so the combined effects of this with age is that you lose skeletal muscle to uh, push things back. You don't open the cricopharyngeus as well. And you have a, 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 a more kind of weakened, um, tonically closed cricopharyngeus that doesn't open. And so the net result is you, you have more obstruction, less push. And this is really a result of uh, skeletal muscle uh, weakening with age and is a normal process. Um, in, in most people, um, there's still an, a enough compens or, or um, there's still enough increase within the oropharyngeal strength that they can push beyond the resistance within the cricopharyngeus. But if everyone were to live to be past 100, those lines would probably cross and everyone would have issues. Um, and if, if you take a look at people who are asymptomatic and who don't report swallowing issues, um, it's interesting that many people have what we would consider to be a defect with swallowing evaluation, despite the fact that, that they don't have symptoms. So in a one study that was done, and you can look at these dates and see that, you know, one of these studies is, is from 1959. So these are studies that are very, very old, but, you know, the truth still holds that um, only approximately 16% of um, um, those in one in one study had had swallows that were felt to be normal based on imaging at the time. Um, and, and in uh, the second one, 22% of asymptomatic patients past the age of 65 had, had um, what was felt to be significant pooling within the hypopharynx during evaluation. So a lot of these modified barium um, tests that we do above a certain age will probably show pooling, and that's not necessarily outside the norm in this population. Now, to complicate it, um, you know, there, there can uh, be other factors as well. And so we've, we've talked about what happens with the muscles with just normal age, but any sort of CNS disease, neuromuscular disorder, local issues, um, anything metabolic, particularly diabetes or meds can also affect swallowing as well. And so these all factor in. If you're looking at someone who has oropharyngeal dysmotility and you want to look and see you know, what to do is the next step. There's a, a few, few different approaches which you can do. In my practice, you know, I think endoscopy is a, fair, a fairly limited yield. If you're looking at the oropharynx pharynx specifically, you don't get a great view with endoscopy. So it's really better looking at the esophagus itself. Um, we often will um, look with a modified barium swallow, and that can be done with also a swallow therapist there. Um, you know, that is, is a nice way of starting because it's not terribly invasive. And if you find anything focal, it's possible to go after that, typically with swallow therapy. But the caveat to keep in mind is that, you know, seeing pooling and seeing, you know, possible dysfunction, slow emptying um, is, is above, is, is, you know, probably the norm above a certain age. So um, um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, fees is one that's, that's, you know, kind of a nice one um, for very specific uh, patients. And the way that that's done is it, it, it can be done via swallow therapist versus um, ENT will also do it. And they'll, they'll take a, a, a very thin scope, put it within the back of the nose, just, just above the pharynx. And then they'll ask the patient to eat certain types of foods with a dye and basically look to see what's clearing and what's not. So where I find that helpful is if someone, you, you know, has issues and you're really not certain if you can do any specific maneuvers or subtypes of foods that may help like a chin lift or doing thickened foods, this is a way to give those foods directly and monitor. Um, the nice thing about it, it is that um, it doesn't require any radiation. Um, it's actually a bit faster to get than the modified barium swallows, which here have had a wait list of a, a you know, a, a good couple months if, 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 if uh, doing it with, with, with uh, also a swallow therapist with you. Um, the downside with fees is that it requires a tube in the nose. And, and so you have to have a patient who is willing to undergo that. Um, I'll, I'll say in my practice, if I'm seeing someone where it's oropharyngeal dysmotility, um, I usually will start with a modified barium swallow and I'll try and get, um, at that same, same visit, the swallow therapist there in the room. 
And then typically swallow therapy is usually my first line step. And I'm usually not looking at doing endoscopic therapies or anything along those lines, unless the swallow therapist comes back and tells me that they think that something is going on downstream. Um, we're very fortunate here as well in that the um, group in swallow therapy is fantastic at Stanford. So it's a really, really good, good, good group. And they've been super helpful in this population. Um, yeah. Question yeah. related to aging. Since mm. you mentioned a correlation between muscle mass and hand grip uh, to orthorangeal motility, yeah. do you see or orthorangeal motility disorders in malnourished or anorectic patients? Definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so it's. Do you think this is the reason? Um, you know, it's unclear. It could be though. It could be. Um, you know, you know, I think that that um, it's it's fairly complex with swallowing. There's a lot of different muscles involved and. Mm -hmm. Uh, any sort of muscular dysfunction, whether it be deconditioning or aging or, you know, things along those lines can, can, you know, cause issues which are at play. So I think it definitely could be. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. This is Ken here, um, the geriatrician. I just wanted to comment. Yes, yeah, so actually, uh, in a lot of uh, relatively healthy older patients who doesn't have any uh, underlying neurodegenerative disease, we see this very often after acute illness. Um, they were hospitalized uh, for a couple of days because of something acute. Uh, and because of the immobility, and also sometimes uh, they, they, they were put down MTO and with poor nutrition, they oftentimes develop uh, deconditioning. Now we think it's actually a type of sarcopenia. And in these patients, we see uh, even they were uh, not having dysphagia uh, at their baseline, but these uh, little things can just tip them over and then they develop oropharyngeal uh, dysphagia very often after these events. And a lot of times the medication also can uh, make things worse like opiate anticholinergic medications. Uh, these are actually rule number one in geriatrics is if the patient develops uh, some new symptoms, we want to review the medications and see if any uh, medication could be the a possible culprit. A, a quick question to you, Karen, and to, and to John also. So in these older patients, is it an annoyance or are there risks? Specifically, do they aspirate? Or is it just that they- Yeah, I mean- swallow? they um, can aspirate within advanced cases. Most times what happens is you you get a prolonged swallow. So you'll have a, a period of a bolus that's that's there more. And if the cricofarin, farin, farin, farin is closed, then you can have a penetration and um, um, aspiration with it. Though I'll say in my practice, I haven't seen tons of aspiration pneumonia yes, unless people are really de you know, you know, pretty decompensated. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's 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 more rare and pretty advanced. Right. I would say uh, clinically, we see mostly when patients, when they're eating, they start to have cough. Uh, uh, these are the symptoms that would alert, alert us to uh, maybe look for um, a dysphagia. We, we oftentimes will refer them to do a swallow, a barren swallow study. And actually in Stanford, we can order an order set, which includes the barren swallow plus a speech therapy. They actually can be ordered a same visit. Uh, and we sometimes will find some patients who develop aspiration pneumonia and we look back and then these patients actually might have silent aspiration because of dysphagia. One more point. John, it's Kian. I have, oh, go ahead. I have a quick question. John, you know, in med school and also during GI training, we learn about sort of the questions that you asked to distinguish oropharyngeal from esophageal dysphagia, nasal reflux, difficulty in transferring. Are there legitimate history questions that can sort of, uh, can, uh, you know, reliably separate out those those causes? Yeah, there's some. You know, I think um, the um, to to have the nasopharyngeal is 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 pretty rare, so relatively specific, not terribly sensitive. Um, you know, a, about a third of people who feel things get stuck at the back of the throat will will have issues lower in the esophagus. So it's not you know, 100% per, specific, but if people do say that things are getting stuck in the back of the throat, that, that they can't really initiate the swallow, that they're, they're very clear it's proximal, um, that it's, you know, both solids and liquids, that, that would point more towards something that's an oropharyngeal. But I'll, I'll say a lot of the consults that, that I, I get from the ENT group are people where, the thought was that this was oropharyngeal at first, and then they're they're going and doing a barium study, and there's obvious di there's some signs of you know pretty significant dis uh, 
pretty pretty significant dismantility and retention below the um, site. So it's not 100% in terms of separating, but often the history you know points you pretty reliably in that direction. John, Thank one you. more point, if I may. Yeah. The issue of relationship between the grid and the sarcopenia in turn and the issue of the oropharyngeal dysphagia is not particularly well substantiated as the room for improvement. Um, for example, I recently had a patient with severe Parkinson's disease and dysphagia, actually both oropharyngeal and, and esophageal, who used to be an Olympian in arm wrestling. So depending on how you use the muscles of the arm or yeah. the arm, it's a great point. You may have a sarcopenia that yeah. involves the muscles in general, including the muscles that you're using in a very efficient way. So if you're a manual laborer, for example, you may have very strong arms and a grip, but you, when you develop a particular condition like neurodegenerative disorder of some sort, that loss is differential between the muscles that are used uh, you know, regularly as opposed to the muscles that you're using yeah. uh, as part of your profession or your activity. So I'm not sure if we should emphasize this, but I do agree. Your point is very well taken that sarcopenia and malnutrition, et cetera, play a significant role in our pharyngeal dysphagia. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make one, one, uh, one just side story. It's interesting. There's a, it's a group in ENT, I, I think they're in Wisconsin, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, George, where they've been um, they've been working with this this special manometry system that they they built themselves. That's essentially like almost like a giant mouth bite block. So it's not like the standard catheters that 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 we have, but it's something which you kind of place in the mouth and then can bite down and actually follow the oropharyngeal strength. And that's been the group that's done a fair amount of the work in this. I think most of it was was done like 20 years ago, but that's 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 sort of been the the most cutting edge way of looking at this. And that's not something that's commercially available. It's only kind of their their you know that 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 a one site <laughs> so true very cool yeah um so 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 case two you know the 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 same story essentially except for there's more solid food um dysphagia in this particular setting and um this patient Are you gonna give us the answers or at the end oh so 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 um case one i'd i'd say probably normal with age um case case two um you know, the same story, solid food um, dysphagia primarily, and this is what you see with the barium study. And I want to draw your attention to the cricopharyngeus specifically, which you see as the indent there. And so the question would be in this scenario, do you reassure and say that this is essentially, you know, just normal and incidental? Do you go in and dilate with an endoscopy? Do you look with a manometry and and see if there's anything that that jumps out? Do you look and you know look and uh, record distensibility diameter of this directly with endoflip? Um, and, and I'll give you my my you know two cents at the end. But you know this you know there there's um, this this would 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 be somewhat debatable. And um, if you notice, I haven't put down myotomy or Botox or anything along those lines here. And so this, this brings up this question of um, UES dysfunction. And so um, again, you know, the same, same basic points that we had talked about last time, which is that, that as we age, you, you do have to have active constriction from the pharyngeal muscles to start the process of opening the cricopharyngeus. And when people age, the uh, pressure in the cricopharyngeus goes, goes down um, and you um, um, tend to have a more stiff muscle in that scenario that doesn't open. And this can be, um, be seen with, with, with um, x-rays as being what's called a cricopharyngeal bar which is where if you go, go back, you, you see kind of this thumb imprint within the back of the muscle there. And this is something that, um, you know, has been seen in up to, to 20 plus per, per cent of barium studies in patients who are older. And so a lot of the times there's a big debate as to whether it's, it's you know, clinically significant or whether it's incidental. Um, and, and, 
and if we do think it's a clinically significant, then the, then at that point, the question is how best to go after it. Um, but there's often a bit of debate as to whether this is the cause of symptoms or just something that's that's seen and not associated with it. This also has a couple different names, and so it, it'll 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 also be re referred to as um, as kind of an a as kind of an achalasia, which involves the cricopharyngeus. This is what it would look like with a manometry, where you you can see essentially the upper sphincter, and instead of opening in that area, you're seeing you can't. You see right here this red pressure band 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 that goes across, and so what you're seeing is essentially retained pressure at that area, whereas that should open and be as blue as this area here. Um, and and you also can look at this with flip and measure diameter and distensibility. Um, but I'll say in my practice, barium is you know is really the main tool. And if I I see someone who has a bar that looks apparent with barium. And I'm seeing a uh, bolus that seems limited above it, um, and they've got appropriate symptoms that fit with it, and you're comfortable that you're not missing another issue at play, then I, I do think it's it, it, it does make sense to go after it and treat it. Um, if you do treat it, the main goal is to try and disrupt the muscle and increase the opening. And there's three options which are there. Um, you could look at dilation. and. Um, traditionally, that's done with um, doing savory dilators, but a balloons are, are very nice in this area because you can place it directly across the area in question. Uh, Botox is often used with ENT group here. It's not something we and GI have done as much in this in in this area specifically. And then, as a last resort, you could look at myotomy. And uh, typically, this was done open um, with success rates of about. 80 to 90 percent um, plus recurrence rates of about 15 per percent. But there's now a way of doing this very similar to POEM with the cricopharyngeus. And so this is re referred to as Z POEM um, versus the esophageal POEM versus the gastric POEM. And this is something that um, Juha is doing here. And um, this this was something that that I had looked at back in my um, um, more young, more aggressive days. And so this was a paper where we looked at, at doing um, dilations of this via balloon, where we would take a balloon, um, inflate it within the mid esophagus, and then try and yank it back across to um, try and disrupt the sphincter with that. Um, it and How big? Uh, 20. Yeah, and and um, it uh, we, we, we had good success with it. We had better success doing it that way than than doing it via savory. So um, essentially we had an 84% with a retrograde pool, 60 if we did static, 79 um, you know, across the board. And when, um, when a contrasted versus savory, this was a little bit better in terms of the outcomes. Um, in our series, we, we, we had good safety. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, it, it, it often took a lot of force to pull it back across the sphincter. And as I've gotten older, I've, I've often just fallen back towards static <laughs> dilations. It makes me feel a little bit more comfortable and it usually works. Um, so, you know, for, for these types of patients, um, my sense is the barium study showing a CP bar um, with, with, with a typical symptoms, which are typically solid food dysphagia that's localized right at the back of the throat, absence of any other cause, um, I, I, I feel that you then could then justify doing additional therapy. Um, my first approach typically is dilation. And um, I think you could do savories versus uh, balloons, but a balloon is a nice first line approach. It's very, very safe. Um, and, and if it is really a cricopharyngeal bar and you're not looking at a, you know, something like a radiation structure, for instance, because this is really just, just a muscular and not something which is mucosal, um, um, safety is very, very good, good with it. And you can expect probably about a 75% improvement with it. Um, if, um, they get benefit with endoscopy, the length of time varies. And so some patients, you might do it once every few years, some people it might be once every few months. So I generally will try once with endoscopy and then see how they, they do. And if they say I felt great and then it came back, you know, then I kind of decide what to do next based on how quickly it came back. You know, if it's once a year, then a doing balloon might be an easy way of keep on, you know, to do it. If it worked great and it was back in two weeks, then you're probably looking at something more aggressive. 
Uh, Botox. Um, so John, quick question. You think you're tearing some fibrosis or tearing muscle fibers? Why isn't it just a donut of soft tissue that is accommodating this thing yeah. that comes back to where it was? You know, I, it's, uh, you know, it's a great question. I, I think there's probably a fibrotic component with it mm -hmm. because these, um, um, these, these, these patients do seem to get, you know, get reliably better. Mm -hmm. And I would think if it was a, you know, very elastic muscular band that you were stretching and it was coming back, you wouldn't see any improvement, right. but it's pretty clear that they, they, they do get at least a temporary benefit with that. Um, you know, and then I, I personally haven't been a big Botox fan in this. My sense has been that if it does work, it works for, you know, 12 weeks at most in this area. And there is a risk that the Botox might diffuse out and affect other areas in it. So I, and, and just with what I'm thinking, the mechanism is, um, it just doesn't make sense to me that, that Botox would, would make a big difference here. So that, that hasn't been my you know, way of going, but if I find that I'm stretching and they're getting benefit, and then let's say it comes back a month later, um, and you know, maybe I've, I've tried that twice and I've been as aggressive as I feel comfortable with the dilations, then I do think myotomy is a, 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 a very fair next step. Um, this is, um, you know, my view of it specifically is that I, I've had some patients do not so well with the myotomy in terms of complications. And I, I think a lot of times these patients are older, they're frail, frail to start, start off with. So I wanna make sure that I've kind of exhausted everything before I send them in that direction. Um, but at least the papers have had outcomes which are pretty good. And, and, and then the last point with that is that I think the, you know, the um, z -pome may change that because if you can go in and cut the muscle with endoscopy and you don't require an, an outside um, cut, um, it seems like a faster recovery and so far the safety and the outcomes look pretty good. So I think that's, that's probably the way of the future. Uh, Zankers. So this is really uh, just before you this. move on to the zankers. Yeah, a couple of points. The first point is that when you dilate uh, the cricopharyngeus, don't you want to know if there is a cricopharyngeal web or a cricopharyngeal or some kind of a dysfunction distally, such as eosinophilic esophagitis? Oh yeah, yeah. To twenty. Yeah. Yeah, but definitely. I mean, I'm 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 um, going into this with the assumption that the downstream issues have been, you know, been worked up and excluded. So I think yeah. um, if you know if if there's the possibility that this is an EOE or or lichen planus or something along those lines, that's an entirely different scenario. So that Im implies that you need to have an endoscopy and an assessment formally, histologically, and otherwise, that there's no other concomitant pathology that would potentially kind of have a role and indeed also contribute to possible complications of a dilation to 20 millimeters, for example. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say in my practice, I, I often will combine this with the first endoscopy. I think EOE, you know, more common within a population that's younger. And if I look in and they have no you know, past history that would put them at higher risk and they, they didn't have symptoms until just you, you know, you know, past couple of years, and I don't see anything um, during the scope itself that would point towards anything else going on. I'm often inclined to stretch in the initial procedure. Um, and, and knock on wood, so far, I haven't had any complications doing that. But I'll, I'll say that I've, you know, I've, I've done a lot of these procedures. So that's also experience. And if, People are going in and thinking of stretching. Um, it, it, it certainly would be fair to take biopsies and look at everything else first and then stretch in a second procedure. Right. Before we move on to the Zenker's diverticulum issue, do we have, in your opinion, adequate data to support the use of a Z poem in patients with cricopharyngeal bars? Because as we all know, this is a yeah. frequent finding in barium swallows. Particularly yeah. the modified barium swallow. Yeah, so so I'd 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 say the only people that I I would send towards a Z poem in this scenario would be people where there's a very clear bar, there's symptoms that are classic for it, there's no other cause that's present, and they've gotten better consistently with stretching. That's 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 the one group where I would send. I mean, I think very very similar towards 
towards towards the the group that it gets that 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 um, gets my automy. I don't think I'd send anyone to that unless I was really 100% convinced that this was the cause of it. Yeah, I agree, and I, I I just wanted to emphasize the point that you just made, which is after you have done a variety of steps, then you go the Z Parm approach because yes, it is right. prompt, yes, it's sexy, yes, it's new, innovative, etc but it's not for everybody because otherwise we're going to be doing deep arms every other day. Yeah. 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 It's very true. Um, you know, you know, to, to, to go on with, with, uh, the bar, uh, bar concepts anchors really is just a natural extension of that. So if, if you have cricopharyngeal, um, uh, uh, dysfunction and blockage, then as that pressure builds up the, um, uh, uh, main site that's weak is the left is the um, left posterior wall, and so you can tend to bulge out in that direction and get zankers. And you you can see the zankers on the right hand picture. If you look here, this is essentially the um, opening towards the esophagus, and then this is the zankers in this area. So typically, the symptoms with this are are very similar towards a bar. Um, but you're you're also getting regurgitation of things coming back up, plus halitosis because things ferment within the area. Uh, the incidence is relatively low, but it's probably underestimated because you know most times we're not getting barium studies and taking a look. And pretty much the uh, treatment is is very similar towards a bar. Um, if you've got a very very small zankers, you still can try and stretch first, and oftentimes that takes care of it. Once it's above a certain point, just stretching alone won't help as much. And then in that scenario, you're you're looking at more doing myotomy plus taking the zankers out 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 as well at the same same time. So it's really the same concept as at the bar. It's just a more advanced stage. So case three. So we are going to switch gears and go a little bit lower. So the uh, patient that that you saw prior that you felt it was the bar, um, you stretch and she does wonderfully. And then she comes back in um, two um, years afterwards and says that she now has dysphagia to solids and liquids, but it's localized within her chest. Uh, she has a barium esophagram, which is interpreted as showing presby esophagus. Um, so what is the, um, the, the best next step? Should you look at a trial of peppermint and reassurance that this is, this is fine with aging? Should you do endoscopy plus a motility of owl? And, and that could be of your choice. It could be um, flip versus manometry. Should you reinvestigate that the CP bar may have recurred given that she had done well prior 24 months ago? Or should you maximize the PPI therapy with the idea that this is probably reflux induced spasm? And I'll, I'll say going back quickly to the case too, I'll say that my approach would have been here to look and dilate. That I, I think if there's um, if if there um, are are symptoms with this bar, reassurance probably doesn't work, and I'm not sure that a manometry and flip will will add much in this situation. So I so I would have just stretched, um, and then for for this case, just uh, think about these options, and it's somewhat controversial whether esophageal um, if you have a change of peristalsis with age. And there's uh, been papers that have really gone in both directions with this. So uh, presbyesophagus refers to a term that was seen during, during a barium studies where patients um, had what's, um, what's called tertiary contractions, which are really spasm within the esophagus. Um, and that was seen more often in patients that were older, though didn't necessarily translate to more symptoms. And so that term was often um, was 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 uh, uh, was used mostly in the radiology literature as being findings with barium studies in patients who were who are um, who are who are past a certain 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 age. There has been some evidence that shows that patients who are older are more likely to have spasm. Um, and are also more likely to have weakened muscle contractions. Um, but that's been countered by some very well done studies that have looked at people who are very healthy and fit in, in uh, different decades of life that haven't shown any change um, um, across that spectrum. So bottom line is that it's a little controversial, um, but from a, a pathology data, there is very clear evidence that the number of myenteric neurons 
uh, present within the esophagus does um, decrease with age. And there is a much higher incidence of, um, of um, getting a diagnosis of uh, achalasia past the age of 80. So typically we'll quote one in 100,000 across every age range. Above the age of 80, it's 19. So um, it's, it's still relatively rare, but it's definitely much more, it's, it's, seen, seen, uh, it's definitely seen much more often. So bottom line is going back to this, this patient, um, I, you know, I, I probably would do additional investigation. And what I would probably do in this situation is option B. And the big question is whether this is spasm, this is incidental, or this is a variant of achalasia. Um, and, and if you're looking at a motility in the esophagus, you've, you've got a few options. Barium esophagram is nice in that it's, um, it's not terribly sensitive, but it's non-invasive. And if it um, does point you definitively in one direction, it may shorten the workup. Uh, we often will um, look with endoscopy, but I think it's important to keep in mind that typically endoscopy is not a sensitive motility study. So when you're doing it, you're basically looking for something that's you know, really dramatic, um, or also to make sure you're not missing a cancer. Um, but you're, you, you won't necessarily make, make the diagnosis of achalasia or spasm from the endoscopy itself. Um, the gold stand, standard has been manometry you know, plus possible impedance. Um, that's got the benefit of a, a, a good, good 40 plus years of use now. And, and so a lot of standardized ways of looking at it. Um, but, it, but it's often uncomfortable um, for patients, um, and it typically requires a separate procedure. FLIP is the newer one that's out now, and this is nice in that it can be done during endoscopy. So it's a way of looking at a motility and dispensability directly um, during the endoscopy. Uh, but the downside is that it's, you know, it's relatively new. It was FDA approved in 2010, and while we do have data that's, that is is starting to come out in terms of natural history and what to make of the findings. Um, it's sometimes unclear what to do with the borderline cases. So, so bottom line is that there's there's not a clear right pathway in terms of doing this, and it really comes down to what to you know what the question is um, specifically and what what and you know and and with that what the patient also cannot tolerate. In terms of treatment. So, quick question. So, you're saying yeah. that this presbyopia esophagus is a radiographic thing, right? Implying that maybe it's transient. Maybe some cases, but you go through these patients, and yeah. it is like going through this yeah. totally twisty thing. So, I think in those yeah. patients, it, it's just anatomical. Yeah. Don't you yeah. think? Yeah. 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 But, but it's still tough in that 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 setting that you really don't 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 know. Is it just spasm, and this is kind of an end result of that? Or is this a variant of achalasia that you know, mm -hmm. maybe hasn't completely declared itself yet? But um, yeah, you know, definitely. No, no, I, get, I get your point that there yeah. may be something else that's treatable, but but I think their esophagus does look like that. Yeah. It just, it yeah, just it, is. Yeah, 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 it's true. I completely agree with that. So in, in terms of treatment, uh, first step is often supplements and lifestyle modification. And if you're seeing a person who has spasm or um, you know, possible dysmotility, and let's say you know they're they're doing okay in general, they're in their 90s, um, and you don't necessarily want to be subjecting them to you know doing anything really invasive. You you could look at peppermint and just chewing very, you know, chew chew um, slow, sit upright af, uh, post meal, small bites, um, you know, plus sips of water afterwards. You could look at medical therapy to try and relax the muscles, but the problem is a lot of these are basically blood pressure medications, and so if they've got an issue with that anyway, you could use these meds, but oftentimes I'm very hesitant to max out calcium channel blockers, for instance, in this group. Uh, Botox can be an excellent option. Um, the, the way of thinking about that is that it works in about 70% of people. Uh, safety is very good. So it can, be di it can be diagnostically helpful and that if they get better, it points you in the right direction. It may improve their symptoms as well, but you're probably looking at about a nine to 12 month benefit. So basically, when I think about it, I think of it as an option when I'm not 100% sure of what the diagnosis is and I want to do something additional um, or where I'm not sure that they're healthy enough to, to really do something more aggressive. Um, and in, in theory, the, you know, the um, um, teaching is that the more Botox you have, you get fibrosis within the area. And then if you want to do something down 
down the road, such as a Heller or Palm, it's going to be more technically difficult for them to do it based upon that. So generally, we'll often do uh, bow, bow talks twice. And if we get beyond twice, there are some patients that you know, we might keep on doing it. But, but typically beyond that second time, you're, you're thinking about doing something else. Um, now, the flip side of it is that there's no published uh, papers that show that the outcomes are worse in people that get these um, actual myotomies after uh, uh, getting Botox again and again and again. So it may make it more technically difficult for them to do it, but, but they can still do it. Um, and then um, past that, that point, then you're looking at, um, you know, possibly the long-term options. Um, so basically pneumatics uh, work in, in a, about 70% of people, uh, the risk of perforation, that's about 1%. Uh, POEM is probably 90% successful, but it um, does require a one night stay in the hospital. And there, there is a risk with it of bleeding, mucosal leaks, things along those, those lines. And then Heller myotomy, um, also about, about, about a 90% effective, um, but it, it does require a laparoscopic uh, procedure. And um, um, in that setting, typically recovery is slower. I'll say that in, in our practice, and I think a lot of practices now in the States, once we get beyond the Botox, typically POEM is often the, the next one which we're doing because it's typically a one night stay in the hospital. The outcome rates are pretty good and you're more you're uh, likely to be more um, um, uh, done versus kind of balloons, which um, often require, you know, going back again afterwards. So case four, and I'll, I'll try and go through the last two really quickly. So an 81-year-old- John, may to... I interrupt for a second, please? One yep. issue that I think you emphasize and I want to reiterate it is the fact that anybody with new onset dysphagia, that age group, needs to be evaluated either by barium swallow or preferably by endoscopy. You do not want to miss a cancer, particularly in the G-junction, a Barrett's adenocarcinoma. That would be basically the end of the story. And the second point is also, I think we need to- remind ourselves that that POEM has a 30% risk of gastroesophageal reflux. So they need to understand that the patients, that is, who go through that procedure, that there is probably a lifelong PPI use. Uh, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I mean for, for, for POEM, you know, um, I'll say that those people that we're sending for POEM are typically so miserable with swallowing that we're, we're kind of being forced into it because they failed everything else along the way. So they're often willing to, to, to take the idea of doing a PPI once a day to swallow better. Um, but but um, this definitely factors into a case-by-case -case discussion and your point is well taken. Um, so case... Four. So um, this is one who comes to see you because of an incidental, um, very large hernia, which is present. Um, her family wants this fixed, but uh, she's, she's, she's reluctant. She has no symptoms. So what do you do in this scenario? Do you fix the hernia because the risk is high that, that this will strangulate? Do you monitor, but just accept the risk that it's, it's high, that this might strangulate? Do you monitor because the risk is, is low? Um, or, or do you just say, why don't we tack the stomach in place with, with a gastrostomy to try and, um, 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 to, um, try and keep this in place and temporize. So just think about this and I'll, I'll go through hernias really quickly. So we see this in approximately 15% of people. And it basically just means that the adjunction be between the, um, be between the esophagus and stomach is separate from the diaphragm. Um, this does typically increase in incidence with age. It's um, linked with GERD and to a lesser extent dysphagia. And there are controversies with regards to how and when to fix it. There's um, four subtype types, which are here. The fourth one we don't have a picture of, but um, type one is sliding, which, which is where essentially everything is shifting up. Type two is parasophageal, where your um, junction is at the right location, but there's an area of stomach that's that's popped up above it and is pinching in that area. And then type three is mixed. And type three is where you've you've got components of both type one and type two, which are mixed. Now, type four 
is where you have something else above that that site besides um, stomach, and that could be pancreas or colon or other things along those lines. It's almost unheard of to have a, a type four that's not also a type three. Um, and if 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 you um, look at what to do with this, you're uh, what you you do is going to based on is is based on the hernia type, the size, and the health of the person there. So type one, which is just sliding, is linked strongly with GERD. Um, and if people are symptomatic and if they are healthy enough to to um, um, fix it, then it makes sense too. And what's done in that scenario is that basically you um, you you take this side of it pull down this junction and then you tack it in place and do some sort of a wrap in this area to keep it in place. That's, that's laparoscopic often with a Nissen or, 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 um, such, um, type two, you, you typically fix in that scenario in that they're almost always symptomatic. Um, and this is the one that's typically linked, uh, uh, most closely with ischemia. And, you know, this is the one here where, where essentially you've got a part of the stomach that's pinched up, but the diaphragm is in place. And this is relatively rare. This is probably less than five, five, uh, 5% of hernias total, but this is the one that if you sit on, you can, you, you can have issues because the blood supply in this area will choke off. And then type three is the one that's most common with large ones. And um, that's the one which, which uh, we have in this patient. And the, the, the current thought here is that if they are symptomatic and if, um, and if they're also, they're healthy enough to um, fix it, that going in and fixing it makes sense. But be, because this has a large sliding component and it, it, it tends to, to be mixed, the risk that this becomes ischemic is actually very low. And so the current teaching is that if people are asymptomatic or they have a lot of other health issues, that this is something which, which you, you can sit on and watch in this scenario. And so going, going back towards this patient, you know, given that um, she does not have symptoms and this is a type three hernia, this would be answer C, um, which is fine just to, to, to watch with caution. Um, and then the, the, the very last patient uh, or, or last case, case here, 70 year old presents with acute dysphagia plus food impaction after eating at a steakhouse with friends, He's had recent dental issues when he's drinking wine also at dinner, no prior problem swallowing, what is the most likely diagnosis here? And so just take a quick second and then the last three minutes I'll go through through this. And so there, there, there are certain conditions which are more common within patients who are older. And so this is essentially some of the, the list here. Um, this is what we um, see as a Schatzky's ring, which is also referred to as a type B ring here. And this is essentially a benign ring, which is right at the, uh, which is right at the squamocolumnar nar, nar junction. And so half of it is columnar and half is a squamous. By uh, definition, it's just, 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 just basically mucosa and submucosa. There's no muscle layer with it. It's seen in approximately 15% of patients past the age of 50. It's commonly associated with small type one hernias. Uh, uh, it's more common in men. And it's classically linked with um, intermittent food impaction episodes. And um, often it's uh, in uh, uh, in uh, board, board questions, it's, um, um, it's uh, uh, what's often presented as being at at a, a steakhouse, with the idea that if people are, are chewing large bites of meat, they're they're drinking wine and they're talking, and so they're not chewing as well, and they get these big boluses which entrap in that area. Um, it's named uh, based on the um, uh, past work of Ashotsky, who was a radiologist in Boston in the fifties and sixties. And what he showed in um, his series was that people who had a width of the ring of less than 13 um, had very frequent episodes of uh, 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 both symptoms as well as uh, food impaction. People greater than 20, um, there were two people in his series that had impaction with a ring size of greater than 20, but no one that had had um, had had second episodes. And so based on that, if you do a barium uh, a tab with swallows, that's a 13 mil, mil, millimeter tablet based on that data. And if we stretch with a dilators, the 
the biggest size that we have with our with with both our savories and a balloons are um, uh, um, are going towards twenty based on once again this data. So if you do see um, these patients, the goal is really to disrupt the ring. Um, if you stretch it, a lot of the times you might stretch a little bigger and then it'll close back up again. So there's a, a few um, different ways of doing it. What I like doing is um, taking a, a balloon, putting it across the ring and then ripping it back across. And that tends to, to work pretty well. I generally will um, do a size 20. Um, the one caveat to that is that you really have to be sure that it's definitely a shock tooth ring because if it's EOE or if it's, um, you know, you know, some other ring besides that, and you go and rip across it with a 20, you, you, you could have significant tears and bleeding, but if you're 100% sure that that's the diagnosis, um, um, this responds pretty well. Uh, typically success rates are very high in the short term. Recurrence rates are about 50%. But the average length of time with recurrence is between a year and a half and five years in most studies. There is some data that uh, PPIs will um, delay the rate of recurrence. And so sometimes we're faced with this question where someone comes in and they have a Schottsky's ring and they have impaction with it, but they have absolutely no GERD, GERD symptoms whatsoever. And uh, we often struggle with the question of, do we do a PPI or not? Uh, with the idea that doing a PPI may slow the rate of the ring gr growing back in, but these meds are also not 100% per per risk-free, and you hate to have a patient on this indefinitely if it's just for something with, with, which you can stretch. Um, I'll say that I saw someone last year where we had this exact same talk, and we stopped the PPI after a lot of back and forth, and um, he was doing fine, and then he impacted again six weeks later. So it, it um, you know, it is something that comes up within clinic. So um, final considerations also, systemic diseases also can have a big role role as well in these symptoms. And so diabetes, um, as you know, in particular, can play a big role role as well with esophageal symptoms. Uh, meds are always a, a key factor to take a look at, and there's a lot of meds which are used, which also have esophageal symptoms. Um, and, you know, I didn't talk about the PPI risks and benefits, but that's obviously a whole talk just by itself. Um, sometimes less is more in terms of procedures, and so that, that, that's why sometimes when I'm dilating the, the uh, cricopharyngeal bar, you know, I might do it in one, you know, one one scope where I look down instead of looking and biopsying going back just to minimize sedation in these patients. Um, and, you know, just to end the last point, I'll just say is that this is a great area for any fellows that want to do work in this area. Um, you know, most papers that I'm looking at are, you know, at least 10 years old, and there's not a lot of recent work in this. And um, given the current demographics in our population, this would be an area that someone could build, uh, you know, could, could, could build pretty much a whole whole um, career and run with it. So I will stop there and thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm a little over. Well, I think a while back there was some discussion of biopsy forceps of the shot skis to kind yeah. of open it up or kind of try to chew it around the edge. Yeah, I've done I don't that a few really times. Works. I have no idea if it works. Yeah. yeah, have, yeah. You, have I mean, you done it or not? Yeah, you know, I have it. I've never been satisfied with it. There's there's there was one paper in G in in a GIE that looked at it maybe like 15 years ago, and they had reported good outcomes with it. Um, my my um, my recollection with it was was that the reason that they were doing it was that they hadn't consented the patient to um, do a dilation going into it. And their form didn't have it, mm. so once they saw the ring, they didn't want to stretch it based on that, but they also didn't want to just leave it, and so they thought rupturing it with forceps might might work. Um, I've tried it a few times and I can say I've never felt like it really did much. I feel like like I've just bit out little holes in the ring without yeah. effectively removing it or rupturing it. But um, it is there as a possibility. The one paper looks encouraging on it. I agree with John, Yuri, but you can also consider a cut with a sphincter of tone uh, yeah. if you're going to do that effectively, which actually works quite well. But many people don't feel comfortable doing that because they're not doing as many sphincterotomies. So yeah. Mine is so that George, so that so that that implies, based on what both you and John are saying, the main restriction may not be what we see endoscopically, but but something like more in, in the wall. In other words, if we just take a bite, you're not taking care of the whole thing. There's something deeper in. Correct. 
Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll add that, that sometimes, you know, you see these textbook pictures of Ashotsky's rings and, you know, we, we see that with endoscopy, but at least 50% of the time, you're kind of scratching your head about, is it a Shotsky's ring? Is it a short peptic stricture? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're, you're not a hundred percent sure it's a Shotsky's ring. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there's data about, data about refluxes of vaginitis in the early because there are gastric atrophy and, and that's uh, acid. Yeah. But they're probably getting uh, a lot of PPI because at least in Israel, many of them are getting like long, long term, high doses of Yeah, definitely. PPI. Definitely. You're right on that. I mean, I, 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 you know, it's kind of interesting. The GERD question is really out there and I'm, I'm not sure how things balance, because there it's thought that that there's less symptoms, so people might report less heartburn, but there's also higher rates of dysmotility, higher rates of hernias, and there's decreased gastric accommodation, all of which might factor in towards 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 GERD. Not being so, well studied. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an unknown. Yeah. John, this is a tool. Great job. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Question. Uh, have you found any difference? of this uh, dysphagia and esophageal disorders in a different ethnic background. The reason I'm saying is, you know, I just came back from a global health in India and there are tons of patients we see and never saw an EOE, never saw a Shatsky's ring. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure does the diet, uh, Western diet or anything maybe contributing to this more prominent here than the other part of the world? As there yeah. Anything about that? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think for, um, for some things, you know, for EOE specifically, um, for a while there weren't any case reports on the entire continent of Africa. So that definitely seems like it's, it's more of kind of a, um, you know, that seems like it's more, that seems like it's more of a Western um, disorder. Um, I, I've, I had a friend who was doing a mission trip in Africa who came back and told me that they saw tons of achalasia, that it, it was just, you know, they, 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 he, he said in the week he was there, he did like 50, like he, he did a 50 um, separate pneumatics. Um, so it, it, it does seem to me like there probably are areas that have much higher rates of certain things, but I, I don't think it's been terribly well studied. Um, for, you know, presbyosophagus and kind of dysmotility with aging, there's so much, there, there seems like there's so, so, so little, so little literature out there in general that I don't think anyone is, has, has looked at any issues in terms of a diversity or else different countries or anything along those lines. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And John, yes, to emphasize this, the classic papers from presbyosophagus are from the sixties with technology mm -hmm. that does not even compare to what we have today. So I think the classic paper, the Journal of Clinical Investigation that described the presbyosophagus concept will be redefined based on flip technology, based on high resolution esophageal manometry, based on oropharyngeal fluoroscopic evaluation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all that, I fully agree with you. And I would like to stress that for both the geriatric fellows as well as the GI fellows to consider kind of building a career on, on this particular theme. It's going to be, and not only that, but also we're going to see in the future a uh, sequela of obesity surgeries, the sleeve gastrectomy, yeah. Ruan Wise, all of that will open up new horizons that the generations after us will face uh, with the aging population. So all of that is going to be a a huge area of investigation. John, it's uh, Laren. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Um, I, I, great talk, and I, I think you, you, get a, you, you, you picked on a, a certain point. The point of that, uh, there's been a lot of these studies over uh, on 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 uh, elderly populations and looking at age and um, motility changes with the esophagus, and it's been very variable. And I think um, one thought that, you know, maybe the geriatric colleagues have uh, thoughts on this is that um, 
I don't think uh, the problem is it's been always based on chronologic age and they haven't been incorporating other metrics of biologic age in these different studies. So you mentioned how there was that study on the healthy adults and it didn't show as much esophageal motility problems as some other ones that showed some problems with peristalsis. Um, I, I know there's definitely been studies that show low, uh, that the lower esophageal sphincter pressure starts declining. But, I'm, but what I'm getting at is that I think a lot of these GI studies need to include other indexes like frailty indexes uh, that takes into account, um, you know, whether there's signs of general sarcopenia or other indices of aging. Um, and, and I suspect if you, if you took that into account, you might actually um, show a correlation. So it may be that the healthy uh, elderly do not have as much uh, overall problems, both in skeletal and smooth muscle. And my bias is that um, sarcopenia is not just affecting um, the skeletal muscle. And it certainly could, you know, it, it certainly does. And I think Layla brought up the point with pelvic floor. So it, I think a lot of the pelvic floor problems that they're seeing may be related to um, the same process that's happening in multiple muscle groups throughout the body. But I think there's a there's it there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't also affect smooth muscle and so if you have um these general indices of frailty it might be a better way to correlate it with motility changes and and i suspect you might see see patterns with if you looked at that um just a just a thought um and i think that may be an explanation of why all these def different studies show different things yeah, yeah. I think it's a great thought. Yeah, I think uh, even in the lower GI tract, we we do see that that motility do change, and then the biological uh, aging process. Even we see a eighty year old compared with eighty year old, a ninety year old compared with another ninety year old can be very different in terms of their uh, you know, muscle mass, and uh, I think that's a great thought. Yeah, yeah. along the same lines, the same thing happen in older people when they develop, let's say, dysphagia and or constipation for the geriatric uh, folks in the group in this discussion, the, the, the gastrointestinal symptoms may precede, such as dysphagia or constipation, for example, may precede the clue or may, the, the development or the diagnosis of, of Parkinson's disease as an example. We see this all the time in our practice and I think that needs to be considered. And along the lines, the, the lines that, lo, that Laren brought up, it's a very essential to really consider all the factors in the equation before you can make these very strong conclusions. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, John. Uh, it was a great hey. talk. Oh, I thank just you. I'll comment about uh, do you think autopsy studies would give us more idea, like comparison of older individuals versus younger, just to look at the histology to see what's happening over there? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, but it's a great idea. It's a great idea. I think, you know, it, it, it has been, you know, looked at in some diseases with the esophagus, but I don't think it's been looked at in age specifically, at least, at least not, not as much, you know, at, you, I'd say at least not to my knowledge, but that's a great idea. I think it, it would be, you know, a little hard kind of logistically in terms of doing it, but, but it would be a great study. In order to do that, Pradeep would require special immunohistochemical studies that would address the muscle strength and volume, as well as capacity to really assess normal esophagus. Typically, autopsies done these days report the esophagus as a side organ, like, like a tube, with no consequence. Unless you do this kind of fine tuning in the histology obtained on autopsy, to really assess the muscle and the nerve infrastructure of the esophagus at multiple levels, you will not be able to really tell very much. So it has to be prospectively done yeah. and very, very carefully assessed. We have all kinds of tools, tools that assess sensation of the esophagus, tools that assess motor function of the esophagus, tools that assess coordination of the esophagus. For example, if you do the so-called uh, ring approach, in other words, you, you take 
the sample of the muscle at the proximal third versus the middle third versus the distal third of the esophagus, you may find different levels of muscular or neuromuscular functionality. So all of that is not attended, has not been done, and it would be a great opportunity, again, for people who are interested in this to explore. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody? John, thank you very, very oh, much. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks, everybody. Great. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.